We are going to look at chapters one and two of Daniel tonight. We touched on chapter one last week, but that was mostly introductory material. Um, and so tonight we'll we'll look at some of the details of these first two chapters, and uh, hopefully you'll find this very interesting. So here we go, chapter one. We won't take time to read through the whole chapter, but I, I'll ask you to scan it here as we get started. I mentioned last week that one of the scholars I'm following, actually the, the ones, you know, you can, the scholarship is almost endless on these biblical books, um, but the, the ones I'm following all tend to agree um, that these first six chapters of Daniel are like short stories. So uh, they're like John Golden Gay is this name of one scholar in, in the Word Biblical Commentary series. I'm following him. And uh, another Orthodox priest whose name I'm blanking on right now, following him. They, they think that uh, these stories about Daniel and his three friends are probably rooted in actual historical people and circumstances, but the stories as they come to us are, are, are really meant by the authors, um, humanly speaking, to be read as like a short story. And we'll look at a couple of characteristics so that we can see how Daniel especially these first six chapters, reads differently than the history that is recorded in the, in the Old Testament. So just scan down through chapter one and look for the characteristics. Uh, what do you, what, just let's think out loud together. What do you, what do you notice as, what I'm calling literary characteristics. So not so much the content, the substance of what you're reading, but how the substance is communicated, if I could say it that way. That be our <laughs> We're hearing a beep, beep, beep. You wanna you wanna check? I'll go check, yeah. yeah. Uh, somebody's car outside is beeping, so Joni's going to check for us. So, okay, so back to Daniel one, and we can we can just sort of state the obvious. So, what do we find in chapter one? We have who are the people involved? The king. Okay, so King Nebuchadnezzar. The youth or young people. The they brought over. Yep. So we have these four young men named. And who else? The unit that was taking care of them. Yeah. Okay. Not us. Not yep. <laughs> so it must be somebody at the bean feed whose car is beeping at us. So, okay. Who else? What else do we see there? Who else do we name or notice? Chief of the eunuchs. Okay. One. Okay, that's good. So that's the who. We, we'll just go with that for now. And what sort of communication do we find in this first chapter? I mean, like third person. Yeah. There's a, so there's a narrator. You're right yeah. about. That. And do you have uh, how how does this how does the material get communicated? Oh. Do you see do you see dialogue? Mm -mm. <laughs> Just a little. Yeah. So. Like the the, the guy like named verse Ash twelve. Finesse. Yeah. Ashpenaz talks and he's afraid of what the king will do if they don't eat the, the king's food and all that. So we get, we're getting um, 
like a plot. We're getting conversation, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this has a story feel to it. So we have characters. Again, this isn't, we can think of these characters as actual people, real people, but the story gets told in the way stories get told. There's there's a plot line and there's a there's some sort of tension that arises. There's a problem that arises in the story. And then, you know, that problem gets complicated or intensified. So the problem is these Jewish men don't want to eat that food. They don't want to be defiled. And we'll unpack some of these details. And then it's complicated by, well, if you don't eat this food, the king's going to take my head off. And then so they negotiate, they work it out. And then there's a kind of res resolution to the situation. So the, the young men can stick. They don't defile themselves. They stick with the, the simple food that they can eat that's, that's clean to them. Uh, and it turns out to be okay. So by the end of chapter one, we have something like a resolution to the story. So you see, you see characters, you see plot, you see a, a storyline with a resolution and conversation, right? So if we're thinking of the way history gets told, particularly ancient history, it's not like somebody has a tape recorder on that's catching all, all these words. And yet we have back and forth. This person said, and that person responded, right? All right, turn over to, cha to chapter 25 of 2 Kings. So right at the end of 2 Kings. It's a long chapter. And if you just scan down through it, you don't find you don't find a plot line exactly. You what you get is what the scholars call a kind of a chronicle. So you get an accounting of events. And you get chronological references. Now you, we get that in the book of Daniel too, in the third year, in the first year, things like that. But in, in 2 Kings 25, you don't have conversation. You don't really have uh, any sort of uh, complication in the plot. You don't have resolution in the plot. You have a pretty simple, straightforward accounting of what happened. You know, the, the Babylonians come into town. They take people captive. They take some of the utensils from the temple and so on. Not, not any real conversation back and forth between characters. And that really is, Larry, like a third person accounting. Somebody is right. telling us about what happened. Right. Yeah. So when you, when you compare the literary characteristics between something that really reads like history, it's pretty clearly history in Second Kings, and then you look at Daniel, we, you can start to see, okay, uh, whether or not we would identify these pieces of writing exactly the way scholars do, does that doesn't matter. Just noticing how Daniel reads compared to how the books of Kings, for example, read. That, that helps us see, and there are other characteristics that we'll look at once we get into more detail that helps us see what's going on in the book of Daniel. Okay. We're going to look around at other places in the Bible to see some similarities. We'll get to that in due time. But as I say here at the bottom of this screen, themes common to exilic stories. So Daniel is set in the context of the Babylonian exile. And these are just a few of the major themes. So God's sovereign, though sometimes unseen hand. Now in the book of Daniel, it is clear God is, is almost like the main character, even though not in the way we often think of characters. Uh, Daniel attributes his wisdom to God, right? I'm not 
I'm not all that great. God showed me this. And so I can show, I can, that's chapter two. But uh, So God's sovereign hand is clearly uh, a major theme in these stories from the exile. Jewish success in a foreign land. So they have success in chapter one. Daniel has success in chapter two. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are going to have success in chapter three. And Daniel's going to have success again in chapter four by not getting eaten by the lion, right? <laughs> not getting burned up in the fire, in the fiery furnace. So success, again, because of God's faithfulness and sovereign power. And then another theme is, these are heroic, faithful characters, regardless of the cost. So again, jumping ahead to chapter three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say, our God will deliver us from this fire, but even if he doesn't, we will not bow the knee, not bow the knee, right? We're not going to worship your God. So faithfulness to Yahweh, to God, to the one true God. These are themes that show up in the kind of literature we are reading. And so the scholars ask us to imagine, much like we would, I think I mentioned this last week, but much like we would watch a movie that's based in history, but it's been fictionalized to some degree. It adds in scenes. It puts words in the characters' mouths. And we are inspired, we are encouraged or convicted in some way, even though we know not everything in that movie is actually what happened, but it still, uh, it still can convict us or inspire us. So last night and the night before, it took me two nights to finish the whole movie, but I, I, I rewatched The Great Debaters. Has any, have you seen that movie, The Great Debaters? Texas folk will maybe appreciate this a little bit more, perhaps. Wiley College is in Marshall, Texas. It's a historically African-American United Methodist College. They had a really great debate team way back in the 30s. And, they, and this, is, this is history. They actually went to Harvard and debated the Harvard debate team which was the national championship team. And Wiley College beat them. They won. And of course, the, the, the movie uh, fills in all kinds of blanks, right? It's based, again, it's based on real people, but fills in all kinds of blanks. But it's, it's inspiring to watch movies like that, I think. Daniel is the kind of material that's meant to do the same thing for... Uh, for Jewish people who no longer live in their homeland, right? They're, they're living in a foreign land. They're living among pagans. They don't have the temple to, uh, to sort of uh, remind them of God's presence. All right. As always, chime in when you have a question or a, a comment. Um, and we'll get started now with a little bit more detail in chapters 1 and 2. <laughs> I'm going to try to describe as we go. Uh, I have some, so to speak, some experience or application questions at certain points. But do offer your uh, perspective, or if you have a question, if you have an observation, please um, share it. But let's start with chapter one, verse two, and I'm I'm quoting from the the New Revised Standard Version. So the wording on the screen comes from there. And, you, and in, in uh, the New Revised Standard, it says, chapter 1, verse 2, that the Lord let King Jehoiakim fall into Nebuchadnezzar's power. So... We got noises in the hallway. <laughs> so notice that the Lord permitted this, it says. This is a an example of how God's sovereign hand shows up in the story. 
NIV has delivered. Delivered. So that's even stronger. Yeah. Good. Any any other versions that reads di a bit differently? Common English is Lord handed Judah's king over to Nebuchadnezzar. Sorry, what word, Larry? Uh, handed over the king to Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, handed over, delivered, or led. So yeah. actually, the New Revised Standard is the softest here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So here we have divine sanction for the shame of having your country destroyed. And I thought it would be good. Some of you remember when we looked at this, we've looked at this at other times. Let's let's look at Psalm 137. It's a short one. It does a really good job of communicating the pathos of the exile. Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept. Notice the repetition of there, right? There we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. Zion is a stand-in word for Jerusalem. On the willows there, we hung up our harps. For there, our captors ask us for songs, and our tormentors ask us ask for mirth, saying, "Sing us one of the songs of Zion." I can imagine these drunk Babylonian soldiers <laughs> taunting the Jews. Hey, yeah, sing us one of those stupid Jewish songs, right? Your God is so powerful. Look what happened to you. Imagine. So they they go on. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my hand wither. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. And then we get into real kind of vengeance. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem's fall. Now they said, tear it down, tear it down. So Edom is east sort of across the jordan river dead sea from the southern part of israel or what what was known as judah at the time and the edomites were cheering on the destruction of jerusalem tear it down to its foundations O daughter babylon you devastator happy shall they be who pay you back what you have done to us happy shall they be who take your little ones and dash them against the rock. That's just, that's about as raw as it gets. Now, I don't really think, you know, this is one of those, just the emotion. I mean, when I'm emotional, I say things I don't really mean. <clears throat> I mean, in the moment, you know, it feels kind of good to say it that way, but I don't really mean it. And that's kind of how I read this. I mean, God's people are crying out for God's justice. They have witnessed their children being smashed like that. And if I were in that position, I'd probably I'd probably want those people to get their comeuppance. So, okay. So just trying to, I'm trying to help us feel a little bit of what these deported, uh, disinherited, displaced Jewish people would feel like. All right. Also in verse two, we get this reference to Shinar. Why Shinar? Why not just Babylon? Does they make Bach beer there? I'm sorry? A Shiner beer. <laughs> Shiner Bach. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's go back and look at Genesis 11 for a second. It's a very famous story. And look especially at verse 2.
The land of Shinar, and what's going on there? Yeah, it's the Tower of Babel. And of course, this is this is uh, judged in Genesis 11 as an act of rebellion against God. Right? This is mm -hmm. this is a this is a human effort to overstep our proper boundaries. So the use of Shinar back in in um, in Daniel is like an echo, and it's a suggestion of how the perspective of the author who's put this book together is, is, is really kind of intensifying just how disgusting these Babylonians are. These are the pagan people, and now we're among them. All right, in verse 4, my version says young men. I'm wondering what other versions say. Good-looking young men, without yeah, defects. Yeah. Youth without, youth? youth without blemish. Youth without blemish, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so... Apple. Yes. Apple. Say again. An aptitude for learning and for smart, too. I'm sorry, Jim, I didn't catch that. Sorry, uh, they were smart also. They had an aptitude for learning. Ah, there we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, one guy that I'm following as we do this study suggests that typically in situations like we're having described here, so so when when one nation conquers another, if it was not uncommon for them to take the best and brightest of the conquered nation and then employ those people for their own kingdom purposes. And that it is it, it is it was commonly the case that these young men would have been teenagers, like even as young as 14 or 15, that they started this regimen of training to serve in civil, you know, civic positions, civil positions, government positions, uh, at a pretty young age. But they were not free people, right? They no. were, they were like slaves, but. Well, they're conquered people. Conquered they they people might not be like, better. could they go to their own homes at night and things like that? They weren't free to leave town, Yeah, you know, but they weren't, they weren't imprisoned exactly, right. But, right. but they're not, but, but they are, you know, these are upper class, like princes, you might say, or aristocratic type people. Uh, and so young men, and they're very gifted, as you pointed out here. And just to kind of keep in mind what I said earlier about the themes, when we read these stories, Daniel and his three friends really look like they're 10 times better, right? 10 times better. They're smarter, they're faster, they're just better. Always better. And, and so that's that's part of the uh, when these scholars who think of these as sort of fictionalized short stories, the, the way the characters are characterized is part of the this isn't a sober historical analysis. This is this is like you know one of these movies we would watch with a, uh, with uh, the the people who are vanquished actually are the ones vanquishing in the end. Okay, enough of that. Now let's look at the name changes in verses six and seven. So the name Daniel means God is my judge, and he's given the name Belteshazzar and Bel. The thing about ancient Near Eastern languages, these Semitic languages, and this was true of English for a long time and still in a way is true, but there's no kind of standardized spelling. And so what we would call Baal or Baal and Bel, it's the same deal. So Bel to Shazar. So his name is changed to a pagan name. Baal, protect the king. 
Now imagine being a good Jewish boy. Now you have to go by this pagan name that's 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 praying, as it were, to this pagan deity. Okay, Hananiah. The Yah at the end of Hananiah, that I-A-H is Yah, that's part of the word for Yahweh, which is the Lord. Uh, Yahweh is the name of the Lord God, creator of all things. Hananiah means gift of the Lord. He gets the name Shadrach. And the Ach, the A-C-H at the end of his name, is related to... <clears throat> One of the names given for a Babylonian god, this actually goes back to Akkadian, uh, but Aku is the name of that god. So he too has a pagan name. Different god. Mishael, you see the L there? So another Hebrew name for God is Elohim. <coughs> Excuse me. Mishael means given to God. He gets the name Meshach which doesn't have a God's name in it, but it is guest of a king. Now, again, <laughs> that wouldn't feel very good either because not exactly a guest, right? And then the last one is Azariah, and you see the Yah again. Yahweh has helped. His name is changed to Abednego, and Nego, the Ne in there, Nebuchadnezzar, Nabu is the name also of a Babylonian king. So, these early verses in chapter 1, in story form, are telling us about the experience of exile, shame, degradation. These Jewish people now living in a foreign land, in a pagan country, have to deal with their feeling of abandonment from God. They have to deal with the question of how do we stay faithful to God? Or is it game over? Do we just figure out how to fit in and get by? Right? What do we do now that we live in this place? There's no temple. There's no, we don't have synagogues yet. You know, none of that's on the horizon yet. How do we hold on to who we are? And who are we? Now that we live in this other place. So there, there's a lot of pathos and emotion behind this story, uh, which if we were part of that culture and this was in our native tongue, if Hebrew were our native tongue, we'd be hearing all this or Aramaic. We'd be hearing all this with all the voice inflections, all the feeling that would go along with the way the story gets told. Now, moving on, verse eight and following. Just a, uh, an observation, and I don't know that it's meaningful, but after chapter one, Daniel is continued to use the Jewish name, and the other three are all referred to by their Babylonian names. Mm -hmm. that means? Yeah, I don't. Yeah, and Just, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure why, but that you're you're right. You know, yeah. I mean, Maybe. we do that too. Like when we sing songs about. Shadrach, yeah. Shadrach, and Abednego. We use their pagan name. We use their yeah. pagan name. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my, I, I would speculate that the reason for Daniel keeping the Jewish name front and center is because when we get into later chapters, chapter seven and following, I mean, his his vision, his response. Mm -hmm. uh, that's I, I'm guessing that's part of the reason. Okay, my version uses the word defile, and it repeats it. Some, some form of defile is repeated. They don't want to defile themselves by eating rich food. And here we, we have to remember that rich food probably was involved in pagan, pagan sacrifice of some kind. So by remember in 1 Corinthians, Paul deals with this problem in the, you know, among the Corinthian Christians. Uh, is it OK to go to the market and buy meat, knowing that that meat probably was in the pagan temple in a sacrifice before we buy it? So, you know, am I am I defiling myself if I, if I buy and eat that meat? Well, here, of course, we don't have any of the Christian context here. It's just, you know. These Jewish men 
not wanting to break the, the Torah commandments, right? It's very clear in the book of Leviticus, there's some kind of food you don't eat. And food that's been part of a pagan sacrifice is not kosher. <laughs> hey, Steve. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting that the our versions now say royal ration. I mean, I used to think, oh, rich food, it had a lot of fat and sugar in it, yeah, you know, right. like what we would right. call rich food. <laughs> but no, it's it's the food that the royal household ate. Right. Yeah. And then the other thing that is interesting is, you know, like in um the Iliad and the Odyssey, they they after they win a war, they sacrifice an animal, and before they drink their wine, they pour out a libation to yeah. their god. Right. So it's like the food and the wine really are connected to right. pagans. Yeah. Sacrifice. Yeah, we just have to we just have to keep generally in mind that these these descriptions that if we read them at face value and just think like rich food, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just their personal preference. They don't want all that whatever. No, it's it's this is deeply about their faith. They're trying to figure out how do I not break the commandments? I live in this country where none, none of the utensils or practices or cultural environment is available to me to practice my faith. What would that be like? Okay, so you know how the story goes. They Daniel negotiates, and they are able to do this test. They not only pass the test, but they pass it with flying colors. So how do you eat just vegetables and you wind up fat? You know, my version says fat. So these are sleek, fat, good-looking young men, and they look better than these pagan people who have been on this training regime uh, that the palace has them on. So look at verse seven, uh, 17. Again, we, we see a little glimpse of God's sovereign hand. God gave knowledge and skill in every aspect of literature and wisdom, etc. So God is taking care of these men, even though they're in difficult circumstances. And they're going to get more difficult. Verse 19, you see the success now that I was mentioning in the theme. These men stand out. Verse 19, no one could compare. And verse 20, they're 10 times better than all the magicians. Intentional exaggeration, making it very clear. You stay faithful to the Lord. He's going he's gonna to keep you. He's going to keep you. Say. Now I mentioned this last week, uh, verse 21, and Daniel continued, and the, the the message you might say is while Nebuchadnezzar passes from the scene, Daniel's still there when the when the Persian king Cyrus shows up. Meaning did, did the, the Persian king Cyrus defeated. Yeah. The king before him. Well, he didn't defeat. So Nebuchadnezzar dies. Okay. In 539. And that's, that is often the case, you know, okay, now the king is dead. That, that country is going to be vulnerable for a moment here. This is our chance. And that's what Medo-Persia does. Yeah. yeah. The Babylonians and the Persians had had been allies before that against the Assyrians and the Egyptians. And uh, so, but kings always have big dreams. Okay, so the kind of contemporary application questions. What do we do, you know, with the question of faithfulness or accommodation? And we, we might think for a second about how are we tempted? What, what situations seem similar for us today? What could be like a, 
a lesson we learned from Daniel that would help us with situations we face? I don't know if this really counts as one, but it's something I think about frequently, and that is uh, taking a Sabbath and what is what is what constitutes rest and not labor on a Sabbath. And like if the rest of the world, every day is just the same. Not not every day is the same. I mean, the weekends are free, free, you know, do whatever you want kind of thing. And during the week you work, but there's no indication that any day is holy. Yeah. So I, I don't know yeah. if that counts as what you're asking, but that's what I thought. No, I, I think that I think that's a good example. And. <clears throat> I mean, the law allows for, the law makes religious accommodations. So if you're employed by a company and they they want you to work on a, on a certain holy day, you can, you can appeal to the law for an accommodation so that you can observe that holy day. At SMU, you know, we had Muslim students, Jewish students who... Uh, were given these kinds of accommodations to observe their uh, their religious observances on certain days, even though class was happening. And the professors couldn't mark them absent or do anything to. But if the person doesn't speak up and say, you know, if you just kind of kowtow, roll over, whatever, just go along, then you lose it. Hey, Steve? Yeah. I thought it was interesting that they chose not to just go on a hunger strike or get up in their face and say, no, I'm not going to do it. That that would probably have ended differently. But instead, he um, created the test environment and said, let us try it out and then you judge. And somehow that just kind of related to me in today's times. <laughs> yeah, about, that's, that's, yeah. Just about a good way to go about conflict. Right. So uh, very, yeah, that's another, um, it's another characteristic of these stories that the scholars noticed. They didn't, they didn't rebel. They didn't resist. They didn't just dig in their heels. So here again is a vanquished people trying to figure out how to live in this new environment and, and acting with some wisdom and prudence, you know? I mean, they're they're gonna in chapter three, we'll see they're gonna they're gonna draw the line, but they don't do it in a defiant, disrespectful way. They are trying to get along properly in this new environment. And that that there is real wisdom in that. Yeah, there's some there's some very controversial topics we could get on, but you know, in in the academic environment, for example, uh, these new policies in a lot of schools is they those policies force you to use certain terms, uh, terms of identity for people, so. And it doesn't matter what your religious viewpoint is, you know, if you don't, if you don't do what you're told to do, they can, they can sanction you. So there, there, there's more, there's more of that sort of thing going on now in the, in, in our culture than, than there was at one time, at least for traditional Christians. Okay, let's go to Daniel chapter 2. So Daniel had, or uh, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. And the way the story is told, the magicians, the enchanters, and the sorcerers, and we're going to look at a couple of other scriptures, <clears throat> Uh, are completely incompetent. Now, there's a little bit of poking fun here, right? 
the advisors to this powerful king are clueless about how to do what the king is asking. But that's only because Nebuchadnezzar doesn't tell them the dream. They have to guess. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. That's the point. If you're so good, you sorcerers and magicians, you should be able to tell me what the dream is. And this is this is part of the storytelling aspect, right? This right. isn't this isn't a kind of rational historical account. No, no. Nebuchadnezzar, right. Nebuchadnezzar is at, he's starting to act like one scholar says, a little bit like a madman. You know, a little bit, yeah, you know, like, like a crazy guy. So he's he's making these rash kind of if you don't tell me the dream, I'm gonna cut off your head. You know. So it is, it's meant to be a little bit humorous, a little bit poking fun at the pagan, uh, the pagan lords. But also the language here, magicians, enchanters, and sorcerers. Look at Exodus chapter seven, verse 11. My version says, Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, and they also, the magicians of Egypt, did the same by their secret arts, their dark arts. So, right alongside the ineffectualness of, of these uh, magicians is the darkness. Mm -hmm. So again, a kind of, even though it's clear, we don't have to be afraid of that darkness. It is darkness nonetheless. And we point out a kind of parallel with the story about Joseph and Pharaoh in the book of Genesis. We won't go back there, but the characteristics of the Daniel story in chapter 2 kind of parallel the characteristics of the Joseph story in, in Genesis 41. Both J Joseph and Daniel say God reveals and God gives us wisdom. God will give us the ability for me, each of them, me, the ability to interpret this story. And then verse 14, back in Daniel 2, how Daniel responds Wisdom and tact. Yeah, wisdom and tact, or as my version says, prudence and discretion. Other other words. Verse 14. Okay. Discretion and discernment is the Yeah, okay. And with courage, right? He doesn't run and hide. He goes asking, hey, what's going on here? And it's really his taking the initiative that saves all these pagan magicians, enchanters, and sorcerers. <laughs> and so when Daniel gets, figures out what's going on, when he, he understands what's going on, he goes to his three friends, asks them to pray, to seek God's mercy. And it says, then the mystery was revealed, right? Again, God is showing these faithful Jewish men what they need to know to be able to stay faithful. And then verse 28. Again, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. So Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar the dream he's had. There's a lot of detail in the dream. We'll just touch on it here. First of all, the size of the statue in the dream. Uh, it's, it's really meant to be awe-inspiring. Is, do you all remember reference to the Colossus back in, you know, the big, it's one of the seven wonders of the world, this big, big, big statue that was like over a, a hundred feet tall. 
And so in its day, uh, I mean, that was just, I mean, amazing is too lame a word. It would have been truly <laughs> awe-inspiring. Um, and so this dream, he has a dream of a statue that's big like that and bright. So Daniel tells him the dream and then is able to interpret the dream. And we're going to we're going to see references later to four kingdoms. But the point of the story here is all these kingdoms will come to an end. And eventually this this stone from a mountain. So it's not this it's not a, a stone that's been carved up by a mason, a stone from a mountain, no human hands will come and crush all those kingdoms. <laughs> I mean, imagine Daniel telling the king of Babylon, the most powerful man in the world, your kingdom's going to be fine, but at the end of the day, all these, all these human created kingdoms, they will come to an end. And the and the kingdom that God creates will stand forever. And then, what does King Nebuchadnezzar do? Again, we're supposed to catch the humor here. That's frosty. He worships Daniel. My version says worships. He worships Daniel. Now he says, your God is God of gods and Lord of lords. So he, he gives credit to Daniel's God, but he offers a sacrifice to Daniel. So again, the, this picture, it's so, it's, it's so strange. Here's the king of the most powerful country in the world prostrating himself before a servant. Is that because the, they had a, the Babylonians had an image of God and the Jews had none? And so therefore he bowed before Daniel because that's the the uh, tangible evidence of uh, of his God? Oh, yeah, I think that's good. I, I Yeah, I mean, it's the best they could do is maybe maybe how I would say that. Uh, because they, yeah, they, they needed, they needed a visible tangible presence picture yeah yeah so daniel's god is clearly acting through daniel because he revealed all these things to daniel about these kingdoms predicting the future right it's nebuchadnezzar's kingdom he's you know the head is made of gold that's nebuchadnezzar so the the value of gold the beauty of gold and all that and the next kingdom after nebuchadnezzar is inferior Right? So Nebuchadnezzar can think, ooh, you know, these things are going to be okay while I'm king. And yeah, afterwards, inferior. Nobody's as good as I am. Right? He can live with that conceit. But at the end of the day, all these kingdoms will fall. And the kingdom that God sets up, the God of heaven, that kingdom will never be destroyed. And this will show up again very clearly in chapter 7 of Daniel and that, that vision where the son of man comes to the ancient of days and is and receives a kingdom and it's an everlasting king and the end of the, the end of the chapter is Daniel is exalted right he, he now has so, so again this is that the Jewish success theme that I was mentioning earlier while they're in exile while they're in this a downtrodden position, God is still faithful, and they will succeed. They will be able to prevail, even though in worldly terms, they don't really have any power. They're subject to the king's whims. But God is bigger than the king. So, Steve, do you think that, that the, the similarity to the story of Joseph is intentional? Yes. Like they're, they are now in some way connecting Daniel, Daniel's role with Joseph's role. 
Only, I think only to the extent that they're in similar situations. I think that the bigger point is that as God was faithful to Joseph, the same God who was with Joseph is now with us. Joseph was in a foreign country against his will. We're in a foreign country against our will. And that the God who was with Joseph, that same God is with, is with us. Now that's pretty. And God, yeah. And God bestows upon uh, both Joseph and Daniel this power to interpret. Yeah, right, right. God will give the faithful everything they need to right. not just to survive, but to, in that sense, thrive. Do, is there any historical evidence that um, in these cultures, they would honor um, exiles that they brought in? Um, that this would be something that would actually happen, or is this an exaggeration? That's a very good question, and uh, I think the short answer is yes. It was, it was, uh, it was certainly thinkable that the king of the of, of the empire, right, the emperor, the king of the conquering nation, so the victors, uh, mm -hmm. he could if he saw. Uh, if he saw promise, if he saw skill, if he saw these this person or these people can be real assets, you know, to us, and they could be they could be exalted like that. Um, now there is a uh, there's a there's an artifact known as the Babylonian Chronicle that tells about Nebuchadnezzar's reign. Doesn't tell everything, of course, but. And so there's nothing in the Babylonian Chronicle that mentions Daniel as an advisor to the king, for example. So this is another reason scholars think that, you know, when we look at the literary characteristics of these early stories, and you know, maybe. I don't think they really question whether there existed a Daniel or not, but the way the story is told, there's nothing in the there's nothing outside the Bible that that would tell us. Uh, that, that Daniel had the kind of status with King Nebuchadnezzar that this story uh, shows him to have. Yeah. So it's or, a case. Of, yeah, go ahead. Or other exiles or other foreigners. Um, yes. Yeah. And and King Cyrus is probably a good example of of this uh, of this attitude because he actually decrees that the you, you know Jews can go back to their homeland and and rebuild their land and um, and the book of Isaiah holds up Cyrus as I mean the, he's anointed by God he's like a messiah I mean, that word mashiach is used in reference to Cyrus uh, but again, that you know, it's it's primarily it's about God's sovereignty over all the nations. Yeah. But yes, some of the some of these foreign pagan kings had real respect for the Jews and and saw the benefit in their thriving. So it it would be kind of likened to um, I can't remember now. You know, like famous the ch the children of kings who were taught by captives that right. were important, you know, like knowledgeable people who were conquered nations and they were brought in and became the teachers to the children, you know, the family of the king. Right. So it's like, it's not like we think of slaves. Yeah. yeah. But it's, yeah. I, I like how you use the word conquered people. Right. Like it was just understood that when you're, when your team lost, yeah. <laughs> you so, somehow was, were now employed by the new yeah. regime. Yeah. Now this is, I'm way out of my, my content knowledge area, but I think, I think it was Seneca. I believe Seneca was a slave. He was part of a vanquished people, and Seneca was brought in to teach the emperor of son. Uh, so that's Roman time, but that's the sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. But 
it's still the case that the king has the power. I mean, if you run afoul of the king, he can take off your head. He can do whatever he wants. But the the theme in Daniel is this question, who actually rules the world? You know, that's, don't forget who's really in charge. <laughs> All right, any, any other thoughts? The only thought I had was looking at how Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, how really faithful they were to Yahweh God, but they also showed their expertise and their ability to Nebuchadnezzar. I'm wondering if they knew or were aware of or had disrespect or understood what happened with Jehoiakim. His evilness. Yeah. If he was, if they were aware of that, and that would probably maybe change your perspective a little bit. On yeah, that's a good point. I, I so I, I would think they would have knowledge of his ending badly. Uh, and not doing what was right. Yeah, I, I would think that did have an impact. They may have been smarter than me. Yeah. yeah. Right. Remind, reminds me a little bit of Paul's letters in this sense that, you know, Paul is, is gun ho for the gospel, but he's like, let's not offend the people that we live with by what we do. Let's make sure that our we have the proper deportment, the proper respect for the culture around us as well. Right. Yeah. And this is such a such a good a, a good thing to think about. When Joni and I lived in Italy, of course Italy is a Catholic country, so it's not like we were, I mean we were Protestants, so that made us second class. Uh, but we were just aware of how you got to know what you don't know mm -hmm. and be willing to learn from the, the local folks and not just make judgments and assumptions. And you, it, life just goes a lot better. <laughs> you know. Steve, yeah. so, uh, you know, in Greece, um, the, the women, I, I just got back on a, from a trip there and we went into... Uh, we went to a series of monasteries that were up in the mountains that were just amazing. But the women of the group had to wear skirts. And you had you had to wear a skirt even if you had because you had to have your knees covered, which what we what you know was the explanation. But even if you had on pants, you had to have a skirt on over your pants. Either a skirt or you know, you had to have something over your knees. And you had to cover your shoulders too. Yes, you had to cover your shoulders too. But shoulders were easy because it was cool. Yeah. You know, but but we all had on pants, and then the idea that you had to put a skirt on over your pants was like a little bit of a head scratcher for a lot of people. But mm -hmm. either get us you either get a skirt and put it on because out of respect for the people who've asked you to do that, yeah. or you don't go, <laughs> you <Right>. know. <laughs> I feel like it's a little bit the same kind of thing. You you have to have respect for where you where you are. Yeah. Well, and it also makes me think. And those of you who went through the early church fathers study uh, will remember about Justin Martyr. So Justin Martyr's first apology goes into great detail to show that Christians are loyal subjects. They're not contrarians they're not anti anything except they're anti pagan <laughs> right they worship the one true god and justin martyr was very careful to try to show actually these christians are good for your kingdom your nation just don't ask them to do certain things right because they can't do that and in the process of getting that point across he was pretty bold with the emperor Right, he he didn't he didn't try to skirt around any of the issues, but he was respectful. That's a good thing to to know. 
All right. Well, I'm kind of planning on next week trying to do chapters three and four, right? We'll do so the next, so we'll do the fiery furnace and the lion's den. And if you're able to read ahead, then notice some of these characteristics that we talked about tonight in terms of literature. There's there are characters, there's a plot line, there's tension, there's complication, and there's resolution. And who, you know, who turns out to be to stand in the spotlight and to be to come out on the good end of things? That's that's the question to keep in mind. And then, you know, the bigger context. How do you stay faithful? How do you keep from over accommodating in this culture that is not yours? All right, friends. We will see you next week.